Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now, here's your host. How are you? Hey, Mark. Very good. Very well. How about you? Good, good. Hey, it was great to see you at the uh, Memo Q Day Seattle. Uh, that was a pretty good turnout. Likewise. Yeah, Likewise. yeah. Um, you know, I would be preparing for this uh, discussion. I took a look at your LinkedIn profile, and I mean, you've lived in a lot of different places. You're in Seattle now, but I think you also lived in New York, Switzerland, um, and a few other places. Uh, you know, and it's summertime. W- what's your favorite place in the summertime? Well, I, am, uh, I have to say it's Brazil, right? Where I oh, come from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because Brazil is. Pretty much synonym with uh, with uh, summer, and it's where I come from. Specifically, Brasilia, you don't have the four seasons; you only have a rainy season and a dry season. But the sky is always blue, so that's what I love. So I came to Seattle, and to my surprise, the sky is blue. So it looks like I'm chasing <laughs> chasing the sun. That's good, but I would have to say, yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. You know, it's always good to um to you know. We all hold our home countries dear. Um, there was a, there was a very famous song. Or there there is a famous song called "The Bluest Skies You've Ever Seen Are in Seattle" by Perry Cuomo, and that song used to be super popular, like uh, early seventies. Yeah, amazing song. But it was all about C- blue skies in Seattle, which is well, kind of ironic because last because time I was here. I must yeah, say the ahead. last time I was here, it was over Christmas, two Christmas mm-hmm. ago, and it was really really cold. Like yeah, ice cold. So and the sky was not blue. <laughs> the sky's not blue. Yeah. So I was gonna say the song is kind of ironic because the bluest skies you've ever seen are in Seattle, but you only see them like a few times a year. <laughs> no, it's not that exactly. bad. But, yeah. Hey, um, you know, I watched one of your uh, video presentations about you know the training uh, that's needed to become a a simultaneous interpreter. Okay. And I'd always wondered, I mean, to me, it's just like, it's like a, you know, a superpower that you were able to do this. And I wanted to ask you a couple questions, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on that topic. Like, how do you learn? How can you speak and listen at the same time? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting skill. But it's of all the skills that you have to master as an interpreter, that's the easiest one. You can do that with a week of training. One and in week. fact, yes, <laughs> if, if you're just shadowing the same language, I'm saying. So, the, the, you know, the fact of listening to something and being able to speak at the same time, uh, it's not that difficult. That skill is not difficult to master. So, and it's something that comes in handy, even if you're not an interpreter. For example, if you're recording a video, it's better to record the script. Like you, you, you read the script aloud, you record that, and you play that back in your ear and you mimic the words, you, you shadow yourself as you go. I do that a lot when I'm doing uh, videos on Instagram and so on. It's a good skill to have. Journalists have developed that skill as well, depending on, on how they work and where they, they work, usually on TV. So it's something that if you, if you train yourself to do in a matter of a week, you can get that down. That's not that difficult. Well, if you offered that training course, I would take it uh, because <laughs> You know, I think that we all have had this happen to us where we're involved in a conversation and we're listening to the other person and and we're also trying to formulate what we want to say in response to what the other person's saying or to kind of add on to what they're saying. And and then you have this like competing thing where I do want to focus on the listening, but I also am thinking about my response, right? And yeah. sometimes if I focus too hard on the listening, I forget my response. And now it's my turn to contribute to the conversation. I'm like, uh, I lost my train of thought. So I'm, I, I, it sounds like what you're talking about would be very helpful. Yeah, that's what trips you up is when you're thinking about something else. And in interpreting, that's the second step. So, okay, one thing is to listen and repeat the same thing. A different thing is while listening, think about something else. Okay, I'll, I, I hear this. How would I spit that out in English, say, right? I'm getting that in Portuguese. And that's what trips you up. So if you try, and that's just us not being able to multitask. People think they can multitask, but they can't. What they can do is alternate between tasks very quick, very quickly. But it doesn't mean that you're doing the two things at the same time. So and that takes more practice, being able to 
you know, do the thing where you listen and, and speak at the same time, and also reformulate your thoughts as you go. That's, that's trickier. Yeah, that's, that takes a lot more training. So a lot more than just one week. Second part of the training as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also heard in your video that, that it, you know, interpreters, they start to develop new neural pathways um, as they go through this, you know, two year training program. And I'm wondering because this whole thing, it used to be that, you know, neuroplasticity, uh, the experts would argue, would end as you were leaving your teens or possibly ex could, could be extended into your early 20s. Um, these days, I think there's a lot of research that says that, that this proves that neuroplasticity can still take place, maybe not to the great same degree, but um, it can still happen to a much uh, you know, older ages. Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is your experience like? I mean, a lot of people say, you know, in order to become fluent in a second language, you need to start it at a very young age. Um, in order to become trained as a simultaneous interpreter, is there like a cutoff age-ish that you would say, you know what, this is going to be really, really question. rough? Good question. No, I don't think so. And it's, you know, the, the whole neuroplasticity thing. Well, again, it's hard to say if you're really opening up new pathways in the brain or just privileging those that you haven't used in a while. So maybe these, these pathways are already there for all of us, but we don't go to a, to a few of them often. And as you start going down that path, it becomes wider, perhaps. It becomes uh, more, more immediate in, in, your, in your mind. So maybe it has to do that more with that than, than with the actual creation of a new pathway. I don't know. But in terms of age, it is true that if you come to a foreign country, like my kids did at the age of 9, 10, after they've already had their schooling and, and their thing in their own language, uh, the, the foreign language occurs to them uh, much more easily. And, but that translates more into the ease of speech and not having an accent. It doesn't mean that they have um, a more thorough knowledge or that they are better able to speak the language. It's just that the language occurs to them more automatically, like my kids do. They don't, they don't think in terms of, okay, if I look at a table, they don't think, oh, this is in Portuguese, this and that, and in English, that and so. No, it's just an object that goes by four different names. Two of them happen to be in English. Two of them happen to be in, in Portuguese. So they don't make that distinction. Now, in terms of interpreter training, what I have learned is that people who have that ability, like my children do, for example, they have a harder time sometimes in interpreting because the exercise of translating is not natural to them for the reason I just said. So they, you know, it's harder for them to look at a desk and say, okay, this is desk in English. What's the equivalent in Portuguese? Because they don't think when they need to say that in Portuguese. So for somebody who's totally bilingual, they have the, the naturalness with which language occurs to them, but it takes some deconstruction. It takes, you know, being able to deconstruct and start seeing things from two different lenses when in the past they were all merged together. So I've seen many people who are totally bilingual panic in the early phases of a training because it's so stressful to, you know, look at things that way that they don't want to deal with that. And I've seen people who are limited in their language ability to start with, but they, they don't, first off, they don't, they don't put themselves under the same pressure of being perfect. And they, they've already been in the business of, okay, I see this in English and I know this is that in Portuguese or Spanish. So they are more used to that, to that task of translation. Right? So, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. And, and just to make sure that I'm hearing you correctly, basically, you know, the, the language skill is one component of the interpretation skill set. The other one is the ability to accurately interpret, which is yeah. not the same as the language skill. It's another skill in itself of being able Absolutely. to take yeah. this sentence, phrase, word, meaning, and put it into another language. Because normally we don't do that, right? Normally no. oh, I can jump back and forth between you know whatever my, my, my native language and whatever language of the, the audience that I'm in. But I'm not interpreting. It's that, and that's a whole other skill set which yeah. can be developed 
Um, and it doesn't, it's not completely dependent upon your fluency in, in those languages. Yeah. Obviously the fluency would help, but, but, but without those skills, it could almost be a hindrance is what you're saying. Yes. And, and again, it's, you know, for example, people who have been brought up in two different cultures, they do a lot of code switching, what we now call code switching. They start in Portuguese and then mid sentence, they turn into, they go into English and then back into Portuguese. My, my kids did that all the time. People. People who are totally bilingual do that all the time because, again, they go with whatever is easiest and they know that's going to help me communicate. I understand that the person in front of me will also uh, you know, grasp the same concepts. If I go, well, it's easier for me to say that word in Portuguese than in English. But these are not conscious decisions. This is just the ease of speaking, right? And, and because they know they are in an environment that's conducive to that and that people, on the other hand, are prepared to understand them. But when you have to stop and make distinctions, okay, on this side is one language, on that side is a different language, and I have to stay in my camp for as long as this person is speaking and then switch to the other camp when it's the, you know, it's when it's somebody else's turn. So well, that's more difficult. But the, there's another layer on top of it, which is to me the most difficult one, the most, the most complex one, which is the emotional layer. Uh, the, the limiting factor in interpreting is not linguistic, it's emotional. Because you may have all the tools at your disposal, like a translator does, but if you don't have the peace of mind, the calm, and uh, the ability to keep yourself under control, to keep a plum in the face of chaos, then all that goes down the drain. So, and again, that's, that's what I look for when I'm screening uh, interpreting candidates at, at an early phase. It's their ability to deal with frustration. It's their ability to deal with imperfection. It's their ability to reconstruct and go back and take something back and put something back in without panic. That's the most difficult part. So in, in you're talking about controlling their emotions in, rela in relation to their own performance, because if they got super frustrated or they started getting kind of worked up, they wouldn't be able to form or are you talking about emotions in terms of the conversation that's going on and being able to con also convey the because obviously what they say is 70 percent of, of communication is nonverbal. um and do they need to be able to um kind of somehow translate the or or, or interpret the 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 emotional context of what they're what they're interpreting it's both because one leads to to the other so if I'm in the middle of a conversation that's getting getting too dense, and I'm and I'm thinking, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep up. Did I hear that right? Or uh, what if he says something uh, you know that I don't understand? And so on. you're already doubting yourself in a way. So, mm. and the 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 trick here is, what do you do, and how do you behave in a situation where you have so many variables being thrown at you, and when you start to doubt yourself, because we all do. All the interpreters at a point say, is that really what he said? Maybe, yeah, maybe not. So, but I have to keep navigating and being able to keep myself under control because at some point I might need to go back and take something back from, you know, from what I said and change. And, up, and that requires a level of, of tranquility, if you will, that if you don't have, it doesn't matter how, how good a linguist you are, and you're never going to get there. So it's, it's both, right? What do you do, or you know, what would you do, or what would what would you advise other interpreters to do if you get to a point where one, maybe you just don't understand exactly what they're they're trying to convey, or you're getting behind, and you know, everybody has this kind of professional pride, right? That they want to they want to be doing the job at a certain level, so they it's hard to admit that hey, I can't keep up at this point, or I don't know the meaning. Um, so, so what do you do in those situations? Well, first off. You need to understand that going in, you need to understand that communication is a very imprecise exercise. People make mistakes all the time, including the speaker. The speaker, you can argue that there are many you know, different and perhaps better ways of saying what the speaker just said. He just chose to say it in a particular way. And so they make mistakes and they go back and they reformulate something they said. And you need to understand interpreting in the same light. It's a conversation. In, mm -hmm. in a conversation, anything goes. Like if I say something here that I that I was not supposed to say, or if I mess up and I you know I I misspeak, I'm going to say no. Sorry, Mark. Let, let me take that back. What I meant to say is this. Right? right. People do that all the time in conversation, and the interpreter needs to understand that 
even in a situation where you're supposed not to make those mistakes too often, and again, your credibility is at stake and so on, there is room for that if you approach it with the right attitude. Again, it depends on the environment. Some environments are more forgiving than others. If it's a training session, you've been with the same crowd for a week, you have a lot of wiggle room. If it's a diplomatic reception where you are standing on the stage doing consecutive interpretation with the head of state, uh, the, the situation might be different. But I have been in situations where, even in very formal settings, you, you again, you, you go back to that conversational mood and it works because everybody understands that this is supposed to be a conversation. So if you do it right, it takes timing, it takes experience, and it takes a lot of self-confidence mm. to be able to do it right. But it's not impossible. No. What do you do in situations, for example, where you could translate the words literally, but you're not going to give them the same meaning? So I, I was involved in a project once and they were creating a report and they titled the report clear and present danger which was the name of a tom clancy movie and it, there, there was a certain kind of uh, uh you know relation to that movie but also to the content of the report and it was so hard to get that into Jap japanese because they the, the name of the movie in japanese was completely different right so you yeah. know the all of the kind of nuance there would be lost what do you do in situations like that you have a few options, and these are coping tactics, right, that, mm -hmm. that you develop. If there's an equivalent in the target language, a different book in the same subject matter, or that kind of explores the same dual meaning and so on, you can say, well, it's akin to that, or it's more or less like this, and you give people a, a frame of reference without telling them exactly what it was. Or you can point to, let's say they're talking about a, a talk show host and let's say Jay Leno in the old days. And you know that in Brazil, you had Jo Soares, for example, somebody who kind of, in a way, mimics what Jay Leno was trying to do. You can point to that as an example, right? Or you can simply skip the reference altogether and say, well, he's making reference to something that's specifically very American. Uh, we, we can try and explain that later if we have time. Awesome. Thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's at some point, somebody's going to, if it's really important, somebody's going to say, sorry, I, I was intrigued by that. And then they're going to ask a question and the conversation will go into a corner where you can explain some more. You can do that as well. Awesome. And I get in trouble when I say these things because there is a school of thought in interpreting that thinks that interpreters are, you know, like, the conductors of a train, you're supposed to stay on your track all the time. I don't think that way. I think it's a conversation so I can step in and out, depending on the circumstances. You just need to have a lot of situational awareness and the ability to do this um, in a way that doesn't step on anybody's toes. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and having those kind of, you said, coping mechanisms, I would call them like verbal tools that you can use or phrases that you can pull off the shelf and say this is a specifically an american thing or he's making reference to blah 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 in sales we do that a lot you know if somebody asks you a question you don't know the answer you don't have to get worked up about it you say you know what that's a really good question I haven't heard that one before i'm gonna go check with my team and get back to you right yeah. <laughs> it's like don't have to sweat it man i mean it, nobody knows everything right the worst thing to do is try to make up something on the spot and go ah and then and then everybody knows that you're just making it up yeah the, the typical case is and, and you probably have you probably have heard other people talk about that is jokes right if somebody you know tells a joke that is funny but doesn't translate well not to embarrass the speaker you can say listen he's telling a joke that that doesn't translate well please go ahead and laugh and i'll explain that way. <laughs> that's awesome. people will laugh people will, will crack up right yeah. and you just need to be careful not to to do this at the wrong time yeah. but Again, it's, you don't want somebody telling a joke that he thinks is very funny and nobody laughs, right? Right, right. So it's one of those coping tactics, too. And I've, I've personally used it more than once. I guess every interpreter who's been out there for a while has done that. that that's excellent. Hey, last question on this topic. Um, what do you do, like, so when there are different formality levels or levels of politeness and 
you know, I've been involved, and I use the, 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 the example of, of, of Japanese and Korean, where, you know, depending on the person's position and your company's position, you would use a certain type of language. Um, but sometimes I want to speak in a very casual way, maybe because I want to, uh, you know, be, have a, a more friendly kind of conversation, a more relaxed conversation. Or maybe I want to speak in a very direct manner and I don't want to kind of skirt around the issue. I want to be direct. And the interpreter might say, Ooh, you know, that's, that's going to be very direct. And I'm like, yeah, but I, that's what I want. Right. So are you ever in that kind of situation where the person that you are interpreting for, they might not be following the, the right protocol for the situation, but that's how they do want to communicate. That's interesting. It, it depends on, on who your client is and what your position in that group is. So for example, if you are a UN interpreter in the booth, you just follow whatever tone the speaker is adopting, right? Mm -hmm. So if they want to be harsh, you're going to be harsh. If they're going to be uh, profane, you're going to be profane to a limit. If they want to be very polite, you will try and be very polite. You have to master all those levels of language, okay? But if you are, for example, the personal interpreter of a head of state, and they all usually travel with their own interpreters into bilaterals, they use their own interpreters, then it's a different dynamic because that person is no longer just an interpreter. He's a, a, a trusted advisor who has been briefed on what the message is and what they want to take out of that meeting as a result. So if in the heat of the moment, your head of state says something that's out of line, based on what you have been briefed. You have ways of reminding the person that, oh, but I'm sorry, I didn't hear that correctly. What exactly do you mean? And that gives the person a chance to say, whoops, okay, let me, let me take that back, right? Wow. Which is, again, a, a sin if you are an interpreter in a booth, right? In, in the United Nations, you're supposed to say everything is heard. But if you are accompanying a head of state, that it's a different uh, task altogether, right? So your job is to, is to help get the message across as intended. So, and of course the, the ultimate responsibility rests with the person, the head of state himself or herself, but you may try and aid in a way, right? So I can give you an example of my very first day in the job when that happened. Sure. And again, I was acting out of inexperience. So it took me a while to understand what I should have done and, and not have done. But my very first day as an interpreter, I was working for the Houses of Parliament in Brazil, and they had a visitor come. They realized they didn't have an interpreter, and I was the closest thing they had to one because I spoke English. So they said, oh, Ivandro, come down to the, to the office of the president, the Speaker of the House. And I went down, not knowing what was going to happen. And lo and behold comes Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, a member of the royal family, with a huge entourage. And before I know, I'm sitting in that uncomfortable chair between the speaker of the house and this and this his royal highness right and i'm supposed to to mediate the conversation i had never done that it was chit chat it was easy enough and so on but i remember that at the end of that conversation uh, the speaker of the house uh, gave uh, the the prince you know, prince philip a book on the amazon forest and he had just been to the amazon because he was there with the wwf mm -hmm. and when he got the gift all wrapped up, beautifully wrapped up, and so on. Well, Your Royal Highness, please accept the souvenir. It's a book on the riches of our Amazon forest. He got the book and he said, oh, the Amazon forest. You mean what was left of it, right? Ooh. Trying to be facetious and trying to be yeah. funny. Right? Yeah. And I'm thinking, did I hear that right? Because you don't say that when you get a present in a, in a formal <laughs> setting like this. And I didn't want to cause a, a diplomatic incident or worse mistranslate maybe i hadn't heard that correctly and then i just said well thank you very much your excellency this is very kind of you but half of the press in the room was brazilian and and the other half was international so it, in the end they knew that something else had been said but that reminded me very early on on my first day that uh in retrospect i don't think i i i did anything totally wrong because i prevented the conversation from getting sour when the when the objective was to actually have a good, nice, pleasant moment. So we took it in stride, and it, and it worked. So, would you have, would you have done anything different if you were 
um, sitting in that chair today? Yes, I would have translated the joke exactly as, as said, with a smile, to indicate that uh, we're just being facetious here. We're just trying to be funny here. And then probably they would exchange a few ironies in, in you know, in, in a very good disposition. I don't think it would have caused anything wrong, but I didn't have that confidence on that well, very first day to actually do that. Right? I, I don't think anybody can fault you for that. <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome, man. Well, I hey, hope not. Um, well, well, thank you for that. And I, you know, I could probably talk or ask you many, many, many more questions on that topic, but I do want to jump over to um, your role now as a global language strategist. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and what you do? Sure. That's a position I have with NIMSI. NIMSI is a market research um, agency out there, like a think tank of sorts, but also a consulting uh, company in a way. And when, after I left Kudo uh, exactly a year ago, I was limited in my ability to go work for other companies. I was under a non-compete, so I had to be very respectful of that. I was paid to be home in a way. But I, but I was itching to do something productive and something useful with my time. So Nimzi and I got into some sort of understanding that I could still perhaps help them approach a few items that wouldn't conflict with any, any aspect uh, of which I, I had to be mindful. But it would also be respectful of my, my, my sabbatical or my, you know, of, of the specific situation I was in, in that it wouldn't be exposing myself too much as, a, as an expert. And then I made myself available to NIMSI to go, you know, develop a few reports and, and talk to people who are interested in, in the interpreting side of things and so on. And I think it's been very, very complimentary in a way, because NIMSI brings to the fore a lot of insights that I wouldn't otherwise have. And I bring specifically a lot of insight in terms of technology, language technology, but interpretation technology, so to speak, with RSI with everything we did at Kudo, introducing our SI, making it successful, and then now with AI. So it was a very, very complimentary, uh, um, a very complimentary kind of relationship and still is. Awesome. So, you know, are, are you then going in and, and working with LSPs that want to evolve their their interpretation offering or launch an interpretation offering and they're saying hey you know what kind of platform should we look at or you know maybe you could talk a little bit about that well what i do more than anything and now i've been doing this on you know on my on my private practice as well now that i'm you know outside of that of that non-compete what i do more than anything is guide people's gaze into where they should look. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks that they have the next big thing in AI interpreting. Every, every, everybody thinks that, oh, I'm, I'm, I have good developers, I can do this, and I know how to do this. My user experience is gonna be better. But deep down, they're doing the same thing. They're doing the cascading model where it's you know, speech to text, text to text, text to speech. And with a bunch of off the shelf kind of solutions that get, you know, mixed into their own special sauce, right? And that is good. So we, we don't have a leader yet. The people who are leading the, the, this effort are still leading because of commercial variables, because they have money or because they have clients. It's not based on their choice of technology, not yet. Which doesn't mean that you can play with the technology in very, in very creative ways. But what I do more than anything is help them reality check, so to speak, and then direct their efforts to where they can be more productive, to where they can be, uh, where, where they can add more value. And that usually includes a market analysis, more so than the technological uh, assessment of things. So it's showing them that, oh, here's a niche where you're strong. Why don't you go after that niche and then establish, uh, you know, suggest a different kind of diff you know, technological approach rather than think that you're gonna change the world like everybody is trying to do because still no one uh, has you know pulled away from the pack if it were that easy the big players the googles of the world and the microsofts of the world would already be there 
So it takes a, it takes a lot of strategic position to do this correctly. So what I, I've in the market. Yeah, what I'm hearing you say is, you if you want to I don't know, either develop an interpretation practice or expand your current one, look at your your strengths, look at the market opportunities, and then look at the the, the technology that is best aligned for that specific situation. Um, in, in, in developing in that manner. Yes, and if you are a, a seasoned professional or if you are a head of a company, an LSP that has been out there for a while, you know these things. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the, the field of AI has invited now the participation of many people who know nothing about language and they, they know everything there is to know about IT and technology. And then there's a there's a, a mismatch between what the developers tell you can be done and it can be done, and what should be done, right? Because mm -hmm. oh, well, we can do it, we can do it this way. Oh, the the machine can do that, and so on. And they do that sometimes in total disregard of the other side of the equation, which is the human interpretation side. People who have been doing this for a while, the many subtleties of how it has to be done, and what does meaning even mean, right? Mm -hmm. And they, on day one, they think they can go both ways and they can have an interactive meeting and so on. And soon enough, early enough, it becomes evident that these things cannot be done. So, which doesn't mean that a technological player doesn't have a, you know, a room at the table, a space at the table, a seat at the table. They do. But they need to, they need the, the kind of insights that we bring in order to see the field with more clarity before they move. Yeah, we, we've seen that a lot in the TMS space um, over the years. Many um, outsiders or uh, you know new entities say, oh, well, how hard could it be? We'll just take a database, store all the previously used translations, and then, and then you'll have it there. And that's just the memory component. Even that is there's a lot more complexity to it than that. Uh, but then when you get into all the different workflows and file for, uh, formats, and then, you know, you want to incorporate MT, it just, it, it, it almost increases in complexity um, exponentially. And, and if, you, if you haven't lived it and breathed it and worked as a, a project manager, it's, it's really hard for you to intuitively get it. And I'm guessing with interpretation, it's the same thing. So if you haven't worked as an interpreter, uh, interpreter, excuse me, interpreter. I just made up a new word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, if, uh, if you haven't worked as one of those um, or as uh, as a, uh, a project manager, you, you, there's all these different little nuances that you wouldn't really know. And again, you, you can't lose sight of the fact that there is, both in, in translation, TMS, as well as in interpretation, a legacy that has been in place for long. Right? You can't just do away with that on day one and change everything all at the same time. All these things that you want to introduce are possible, but not at the same time. You need to give the market time to absorb and give people time to retool and give people time to move about. So you can't, for example, suggest that interpreters overnight start working from home, which they now do, and at the same time, start servicing meetings on their own without a booth mate for up to one or two hours, which people are now asking interpreters to do. And on top of that, say, oh, and by the way, because you're not commuting, let's cut your rate by half, right? Again, in time, after you realize that you can now double dip and triple dip and you can do a lot more from home, if that is the case, depending on where you are and your language combinations and so on, you can advance on all of those things. But you can't propose that on day one just because it's commercially feasible or technologically feasible. Yes, it can be done, but should it be done? No, because you're gonna be shot down in flames. There's a legacy, there's a huge community of interpreters, excellent professionals who understand this better than you do, who have ties to their clients, in a way that you can't imagine, and they're going to you know, make waves. They're going to talk to people, and they're going to try to protect their their market, and, and rightly so. So you have to give these people a voice. You have to talk to them. You have to be respectful of what they have built, and to the extent possible, keep both going, which is a good thing Kudo is doing. Kudo still has the human interpretation side in the marketplace that we created, where you have 12,000 interpreters sitting there who have tried the system, and you're now exploring AI, but with full knowledge that 
one doesn't replace the other. One helps you go into corners where no interpretation was happening before. In those corners where interpretation was already popular, you don't suggest that they churn over to AI on day one because you know better than that. Right? Yeah. So, so what markets are most exciting for you right now? And, um, and then also let, let's talk about the technology in terms of specific applications of technology. You know, you know some really cool things that can be done. What, what most excites you in, in those two things, uh, market and technology? I think the market is still trying to make sense. And that's not just in translation. The market is still trying to make sense of AI and to what extent it could be useful. And there's a lot of experimentation going on, which is, which is to be expected. And in interpretation, as I said, everybody's trying to put something out there that they think is, is going to be the next big thing, but there's no leader yet. So, because nobody has the entire solution, you may have the best clients and you may have a lot of funding, but you don't necessarily have the best uh, technology. And you might be in a, in a place where you don't have a lot of leverage even trying to get that thing out. So, or you don't know anything about the market to the extent that you don't know how to even market your services, right? Mm -hmm. You have big brands out there that are having a hard time, that are having a hard time going into South America, for example, or Brazil specifically and so on. So it takes a lot of, of specific knowledge uh, that you need to acquire elsewhere or partner with people who have it in a different manner. But in terms of technology and overall in the market, what I think we're going to see is a lot of amalgamation. In the next year or so, I think we're going to start to see players merging or combining in partnerships of some sort where they complement one another. So, and that's, I think, the, the thing that probably is going to reveal in the near future a leader or a couple of leaders who are going to be kind of setting the, the bar for for the rest of us so far it's all experience uh, exper experimental if i may so Can you say that yeah and it's hard to even pinpoint a success story other than very successful attempts kudo for example of course being one of them it's the one i i know better but i see a lot of companies trying to innovate and trying to also get out of just um the traditional meeting conferencing space. So there's a lot of operations happening in at call centers or places where you need to make announcements on a regular basis in different languages mm -hmm. or, you know, within the space of, you know, the travel industry and, and whatnot that we don't think of immediately when you think about AI and language. And so I think the, with the right vision and the right strategy, you can take what once was an interpreting technology and apply it over to a different set of clients who are doing something with language that's not necessarily the interpretation of a meeting, right? Right. That totally makes sense. Yeah, I mean, if you think about all the different voice communications that, that we receive on a regular basis, whether it's text to voice or whatever it is, voicemails, whatever. Um, what? But think, think for a moment, think for a moment. How many times have you been on a plane and you had to be put through a tedious repetition of the same um, security message in four different languages. Three they different. keep interrupting my movie when I'm trying to yeah. watch the movie and they keep going the same nice, message in nice four different things. <laughs> yeah. nice to have a channel where you can on demand select the information you need to, to have, or something like that, or a call center, or, you know, there's so many applications that you can think of. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Hey, do you do you find that there are some markets that are more open to uh, competition and innovation than others? Oh yeah, and in in very generic ways. In, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. I've worked in Europe for seven years, and I've worked in the U.S. and also South America, of course, where I come from. I find the things on this side of the pond. You know, North America, South America, even the Caribbean to a certain extent, to be more open to new technologies and to, to trying new things. In Europe, I see a much more established market where 
tradition plays a big role where the players have a lot of weight in what they and what they can they can sway and it's harder overall to introduce uh, novelties in terms of technology when i went to geneva to work for itu the oldest specialized agency of the united nations as the chief interpreter i had to record the program for next day in in a phone answering machine remember the old days maybe you and i are old enough to remember the old days where if you wanted to go to the movies there was a number you called and you got the the program yeah. and at this theater at this time the movie is this and you know the times are such and such yeah. in the you know next door different theater these are the times and so on so i had to record that like okay tomorrow is such and such a day and uh, we're going to have this event in room such and such in the english was we're going to have this person and that person in the french was this person and that person and i was recording this until 11 p.m every night and if i made a mistake in the pronunciation of a chinese name towards the end of that recording I had to go and repeat the whole thing again. I said, this can't be done. I mean, there are so many new and better ways of doing this. And the minute I you know, did away with that phone answering machine, I had a mutiny in my hands. People kind of, you know, went on, on parade and we know we need that. We need that because it's, it's like it's always been, right? Always been done. Yeah, but again, uh, in in a matter of a few months, we were able to completely modernize that. Now, people at ITU, at least, they can send you an SMS that changes only the timing for your meeting. You don't need to to know what's happening about you know for everybody else and so on. I can change just one interpreter. I can change a full team of interpreters, and I can do this as many times as often from the comfort of my home or while I'm you know, riding on the train on my way to the to the venue, right? So it gives you freedom, it gives you a lot of, and but I had, I remember I had interpreters at the end of my tenure at, at ITU, I had interpreters emailing me saying, well, thank you very much for all you did. Because of you, I now have an email. <laughs> this, is, this is 2016, right, 17. Wow. So now I can use email. And many of them didn't, didn't bother to even go there. Yeah. I, so yes, I think the quote unquote, uh american approach to this or you know north american approach to this it comes with with you know it in, includes a, a bigger openness to to technology yes yeah i i lived in japan for over five years and i loved it i was there with my family it was a great experience loved living there working there um there are times though where the japanese were um, I'm talking about the language industry specifically, um, kind of slow to adopt new technologies. Um, cat tools, it was a slower uptake there. Uh, the, uh, it's funny, during, I was actually there during COVID and they were still using fax machines. Companies, so you get a business card in Japan, there's a fax number there. And the local municipalities were faxing in their reports for all of the COVID's. Uh, COVID incidences, and then somebody would have to take all the faxes and then kind of, kind of compile them, and nobody would think about creating a shared document or a spreadsheet or anything like yes. that. It changed there, though. It changed. The whole remote work thing changed because before in Japan, it was like, no, there's no such thing as remote work. You've got to be in the office from this time to this time. There's no flexibility there, and no. guess what? They changed. No. Uh, but in terms of the interpretation market, uh, when I was there, I, at a couple of different times, uh, we had customers that would ask us to provide interpretation services because the market in Japan is kind of locked up. There are two schools um, that provide interpretation training, and they also offer interpretation services. So they take their best and brightest students, put them to work, and they kind of have a lock. I would say probably about 80% of the market. Um, the market is... Uh, the, 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 the prices are set at a at a certain level, and there's I would say little competition because all the all the best interpreters work for those two schools. They've got the big contracts, so it's it's difficult to compete. I do see opportunities for providers that can come in with new technologies, but you still at the end of the day you need that interpretation pool, the pool of interpreters to 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 bring to the table, um, and if they're not willing to give up those traditional kind of engagements, uh, it, it, it's very challenging. But, you know, I, 
it's, it's just fun to, to look at the differences. And, you know, you see, like you said, North America, the, the market tends to be a bit more fluid and people are more willing to, hey, try something new. So it's kind of, yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, what, what you just said resonates with me a lot. We, again, my experience in Switzerland. In Switzerland, they're all about ladders. There's this mm -hmm. thing about ladders. I remember going to the company, the, the phone company, Swisscom, to try and change my plan. I was in the store, and we all agreed, okay, as of now, your plan is a different plan. And so on. I said, okay, so, and you're going to have to pay a difference of so much. I said, okay, fine. Here's my credit card. Oh, no, we don't take payments at the store. We're going to get a ladder in 15 days. And you have to reply to that letter. And I said, no, this, this is insane. I'm already standing here ready to pay you. Yeah. Read on everything, right? Oh, no, no. That's, uh, we have to follow that process. Right? I think it's, oh, and, and very frustratingly, nobody accepted, very few vendors accepted credit cards in Switzerland. The mm. hub of the international finance. finance. Yeah, I think SWIFT, the whole SWIFT. Uh, credit cards. That's, yeah. But, and again, love Switzerland, love my Swiss friends, and love the experience. Would go back to Switzerland any day. It's, it's not a criticism. It's, again, one of those cultural differences that it, it hey. takes a while for you to adapt to. Variety is the spice of life. And for as many things that I found frustrating in living in different countries, um, I always found way more, um, I, I would, would call it new, exciting, interesting components as well. And, and a lot of times then I'd, I'd come back to the U.S., for example, and say like, why are we doing it this way? <laughs> you know, when there's it's so many, there's so many better ways to do it. For example, if you want to talk about Japan, you can talk about the train system, for example. I can talk about healthcare, or health insurance, you know, I mean, I could go on and on and on. There's, so I don't think any country is perfect, but in the context of localization, there all there's all different, you know, markets, practices, and, um, you know, it's just an opportunity to learn. But, you know, one thing that I, that I really enjoyed in Switzerland, and that was a, a very positive change of pace for me coming from the U.S., is how much value people attach to their quality of life. Well, totally. And quality of life is being able to sit down for two hours and break your day for lunch. So, okay, at 12, I you know the pan is down, I'm out the door, and I go meet with my friends. We're going to have a nice meal, a sit-down uh, lunch at, you know, somewhere, and then we're going to leave that place and go have coffee at a different place. And it takes two hours. Everybody stops for those two hours. In the convenience store at the little village where I lived, you had to memorize their times because they, after a certain time, they all close the door and go have their lunch. So it's not all about, okay, 24 by 7, we're here to serve you. The client is always right. No, we're here to make a good living. We're here to enjoy life together, right? So that, that when I, again, when I came back to New York and I'm having a sandwich in front of my computer and, the, and this is lunch and I'm thinking, well, something is wrong with this picture, man. I, I missed right. that side of, of my 20, experience. 20% 20, 20 of American meals are eaten in the car. So, you know, there's something wrong with that, you know. Yeah, that's the thing about with that, yes. Yeah. So, well, hey, well, you know, enjoy the conversation. Enjoyed meeting you uh, in person the other day at uh, Memoki Day Seattle. And uh, since we're both in the same area here, we should uh, should grab a cup of coffee sometime. Absolutely, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah. you, you've got a tr tremendous amount of experience and knowledge. Um, if... You know, wh where do, what sources do you look for? I mean, obviously you have an advantage if you're, you're working uh, with NIMSI in terms of you have access to a lot of really uh, valuable insights and research. Um, what other, like, you know, influencers or associations or so on that do you follow that gives you kind of a, an understanding of what's going on in our industry and in future trends? Well, I, I follow NIMSI, of course, and I follow Multilingual. I'm a contributor to Multilingual magazine. Mm -hmm. I have a column called past, called past Tense, where we speak about, you know, the translation and interpretation in history and things like that. So it's a bi-monthly uh, column. And I read that magazine cover to cover. It's funny because it used to be a magazine that, you know, it's been around for a long time and it's been resuscitated, right? Thanks. Yeah. To the vision of Mary Elaine and Renato and, and, and a few more people. So it's a pleasure to read that magazine. But I also follow the competition, right? I, no. I follow what you know, the Slater is doing and I follow uh, a lot of what's going on on LinkedIn and some of the influences that we met with that day, like Stefan and those guys. 
Yeah. And I try to, to keep abreast of, you know, of what's happening out there to the best awesome. of my ability. Yeah. And not just in interpreting. So I follow, because before I was an interpreter, I was for 20 years a translator as well. I was the head of my own agency in Brazil for 17 years. So I, I tried to keep, uh, you know, keep uh, up to speed on, on what's happening in the TMS uh, market as well and, and elsewhere. Awesome, man. Well, it's great advice. And just a, a, a quick kind of uh, add on to that. It's funny. I got my start in the localization industry because of Multilingual Magazine. Um, I, I was approached by a, a company that uh, that was offering local project management services, uh, and that was Adequest. And Hiro Machado was the, the CEO and founder, co-founder of, of Adequest. And, and I said, well, before I, I accept the job, I want to do some research on the industry. And I, re I read through like 10 issues of Multilingual, and they had this job um, advertised for CEO Asia Pacific from a Swiss company. Wow. Um, and, and I was like, this, everything that they were looking for totally aligned with my background. Um, I wrote the recruiter, didn't get, they said, Hey, we've already got somebody. So I took the job with Adequest. Two months later, the recruiter came back to me. Are you still available? And I was like, Oh no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went through that process and, um, and it turned out to be one of the best jobs I had ever had. It was with CLS communication for four years, uh, worked with Florian who founded Slater. Uh, and, and got a bunch of other great contacts and, and, and nice, you know, nice. learning opportunities, all because of multilingual back in the day. And it's so, I'm so happy that Renato and Tucker and the rest of the, uh, the Nimsy team kind of kept, kept that alive. So anyway, Wanda, great talking with you and uh, I'd like to wish you an amazing summer, even though it's not Brazil, it's, uh, the sky mm -hmm. is blue here now. And uh, <laughs> it's as hot as Brazil, I can tell you that. It's yeah. pretty hot this last couple of days. Yeah. yeah, wow, wow, yeah. that's crazy. So, all right, man. Well, hey, you have a, a, a great rest of your summer, and I hope to talk Likewise. to you soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Great to, to speak to you and also your, your fans out there. Awesome. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks. 